conversation. Yeah, please, yeah, sorry, please do, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and get us started here. Um, mm -hmm. Really appreciate everybody turning out tonight. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're excited to host uh, contributors to Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American uh, Political Prisoners, for a conversation on the political and physical implications of opposing fascism and white supremacy while living under state control. Um, and if you don't already know, this is sort of a part of a series uh, that Eric and Josh have been coordinating uh, with our friends from AK Press. And this is actually the third uh, event in the series. So definitely go check out the first two, which were fantastic. They're available on YouTube. Um, Firestorm is a 16 year old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events like this one uh, that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to book events uh, online uh, in addition to doing things in store because we love to be able to connect with people uh, at a distance and across borders as we're doing tonight. Um, and also because we know that COVID continues to be a significant barrier for a lot of folks in our community uh, to connect and engage. So uh, our next online event actually is happening um, tomorrow night. Uh, so if you enjoy this one, join us again tomorrow. That'll be with authors Ben Lorber and uh, Shane Burley, who are going to be discussing their new book, uh, Safety Through Solidarity, A Radical Guide to Fighting Anti-Semitism. Uh, and then in August, we're actually going to be hosting Adrian Reed Brown for a hybrid book tour event, uh, which you can sign up for online as well. So uh, to check all that out, keep an eye on our social media, or um, I can also share a link uh, to our newsletter in the chat, which is pretty infrequent, but features all of our upcoming events. So tonight, uh, we are, uh, I guess, in anticipation of the International Day of Solidarity with uh, anti-fascist prisoners on July 25th. Uh, we're doing this event as a fundraiser for the International um, Anti-Fascist Defense Fund. And uh, as of a few minutes ago, when I checked, it looked like attendees had helped us raise about 350 bucks, which is great. Um, and I'll drop a link, uh, a donation link in the chat in case anyone didn't get a chance to chip in when they were signing up and wants to do so. So tonight we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Um, if you've got questions as we go along, you can type those out. Uh, there should be like a Q&A icon that looks like a speech bubble or something. Um, uh, either at the bottom of your screen on a computer or maybe the top if you're on a phone. Um, but definitely feel free to go ahead and, and get those ideas out and we'll keep an eye on that and then hopefully have a little bit of time at the end to pull questions from the audience. So really excited to get started here. I'm going to introduce our guests. Uh, Alyssa Azar is an independent journalist originally from Syria who covers right-wing violence and activity as well as anti-fascism in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in May, they were arrested and charged with trespassing while attempting to cover police clearing of a pro-Palestinian encampment uh, at Portland State University. Uh, Alyssa uh, has received support from a coalition of organizations, including the Freedom of the Press Foundation and the Committee to Pre uh, Protect Journalists, and really appreciate Alyssa joining us tonight um, in a kind of moderator role. Thanks. Um, we've also got Eric Pien, uh, who is a father, a poet, and an activist. Last December, he was released after spending nearly 10 years uh, as a political prisoner for an act of protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He was held in solitary confinement for years uh, and has been, has been assaulted uh, by both guards and white supremacists. Uh, Eric has published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My uh, Cell. You can also find his uh, sentencing statement in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements between, uh, Before Judge and Jury. All right, and, and last but not least, David Campbell joining us at, at a great distance uh, is a lover of language and the arts, uh, who was two weeks away from moving to Paris to study uh, French translation uh, when his dedication to combating the alt-right drew him to a protest at which a brawl broke out and a 56-year-old intoxicated alt-right man was knocked unconscious. Cops uh, stepped in and uh, broke David's leg in two places, and the district attorney's office filed gang assault charges against David, who took a non-cooperating plea agreement and served 18 months at Rikers Island, coinciding 
with the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Terrible timing. Uh, David translated revolutionary affinities towards a Marxist anarchist solidarity. So um, thanks so much, friends. Really appreciate you joining us here. I know we're going to have a great conversation. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off uh, to Alyssa. Thank you so much for the intros. And thank you so much for hosting us and having us today. Um, I think this is going to be a interesting and informative talk. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say solidarity with Palestine and solidarity with Palestinians and with the resistance and solidarity with anti-fascists everywhere. Um, I don't want to say that word now in an elevated political climate because I think it has been for quite some time, but things certainly do seem to be escalating rather quickly um, at the same time as a sort of mainstreamification of fascism, if you will. So I think solidarity now is really, really so important. Um, so first question I have for you guys is if you could start off with uh, maybe sharing what you were charged with, what you were sentenced for, and maybe how long you both spent inside. Yeah, um, yeah, sure, I can start that. So I um, I was originally charged with like a whole range of wacky stuff. Like I was charged with loitering while wearing a disguise and like, uh, man, all kinds of stuff that was thrown out. Um, the cop, uh, as Liberty mentioned, broke my leg uh, when he arrested me and, you know, uh, just kind of appeared on the scene while this brawl was going on, didn't say anything, and just charged at me, broke my leg. And then so uh, immediately kind of the paper trail that he started creating was that like, oh, you know, he was super violent. I had to restrain him with my partner. And like he was trying to put me in a headlock and put this other guy in a headlock. None of that was true. So like my original charges and what was picked up and, and reported not very heavily on, but for a minute there was held up. By, by the far right, like was going around Twitter and tabloids, was that like I had tried to strangle this guy, the 56 year old guy who was knocked out, that I punched him repeatedly, that I tried to strangle the cop um, and nothing about my leg, right? So like that was the original narrative and the charges fit that narrative because cops can do this where they will, will create a narrative, they'll craft charges to fit and the DA will be like, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Let's give this guy X amount of time, right? Like it happens all the time, I swear to God. I would not have been able to tell you that before my arrest, but like, I promise you that's a real thing. And um, so then we got video camera footage, um, video camera footage, you know, like the kids for their video cameras. Um, well, we, we got, so we got like security camera footage, right? And it showed none of this. And so like all those charges were dropped and they charged me with gang assault, which is like uh, very hard to beat. It's a New York uh, state law that dates to like the Giuliani Pataki era when they were locking up lots of young black and brown men primarily. Um, you know, like cleaning up uh, the city sort of thing. And so it's a very low burden of proof. Um, you fit the statute if you are in a group of three or more people and you're in a fight. And uh, it's a three and a half year mandatory minimum, right? So basically, if you're in a fight with three or more people um, and they have video of it, like, you know, you can't claim self-defense unless you try to run away first, right? So you're going to do three and a half years in prison if they want to pursue that, right? And there were a couple other charges on there, like assaults uh, with an object. You know, I, I kicked the guy while wearing a shoe. So instead of just charging me with like simple assaults, they charged me with assaults with an object, the object being my shoe. I wasn't wearing like, you know, Nazi stomping, like steel toe boots. I was wearing like a lightweight mesh top running sneaker, you know, um, and, and that counts as an object. So I could have hit him with like a brick and it would have been the same charge, right? So well, all that to say, I know it's a little complicated, but like, the charges that they throw at you could be any number of things, right? Like they want to justify their use of force. They want to justify why they picked you when really there's no reason they just picked somebody, you know, they saw dudes in suits and dudes in black block and they're like, I'm going to arrest one of those dudes, right? In black block. Um, so, so what I ended up taking a non-cooperating plea to was attempted gang assault and assault with an instrument. Um, and yeah, so that's, that got me 18 months. I served 12. I was actually in for 12 um yeah was that the question just the charges in the sense yeah yeah, yeah. i have a follow-up yeah. but i can wait till you answer yeah. yeah eric i'm done you want to take it away <laughs> okay i was waiting for the follow-up Ball is yours. Oh, okay so i was arrested in 2014 after throwing molotov cocktails at a congressman's office in kansas city i had gone to ferguson to participate in the uprising i was there for a couple days and a night um, when I came back 
into the city, no one in Kansas City was really open to direct action, or at least no one that I knew. And so we had our little tiny affinity group and, and got to work. And when that wasn't really raising the temperature in Kansas City for a, like raising awareness for action and solidarity with those in Ferguson, I decided to, uh, to try to take it one step further. So I was charged with four, kind of like how you were uh, hit with the, uh, the weapon thing because it was your shoe. Mm -hmm. um, I was charged with possession of an incendiary device, using an incendiary device, using an incendiary device against a government building, and then mm -hmm. possession of an incendiary device in a government building. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's all the same. Like, it's all one thing. Like, you threw a fucking bottle. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, they also seem like incompatible. Like you can't be possessing it, using it inside the building, attacking the building. Right. Like it's like yeah, but they could stack charges, right? So Ridiculous. Just, yeah. So it was a 15-year mandatory minimum. Um, we ended up taking the the non-snitch yeah. plea, um, or a 30 minimum. So we we took the non-snitch plea, got it down to just the one charge with a mandatory minimum of 10. And so I ended up doing nine years and five or four months. Um, of that sentence seven and a half of that was in solitary was in the shoe or adx and i'm happy to be here we're very happy that you're both out um follow up for both of y'all what uh what was the security level of the facilities that you were in um what facilities were you in like jail versus prison can you kind of expand on your experiences there yeah um I, I think so like i'm I'm pretty nitpicky and stuff like uh that i write about uh using the terms jail and pr not using the terms jail and prison interchangeably but here just so we're all aware like orally like it doesn't bother me really as much just because that's how people talk like so technically i didn't go to prison i went to jail right but like we talk about like being an anti-fascist in prison i'm not going to be like i'm not going to that panel because that's not real you know like this yeah but yeah. technically i didn't go to prison i never went to prison right and um jail guys like if you're in jail there's a lot of guys who've been in and out of jail like for years for little tiny petty crimes like you know boosters right like guys who are like addicted to a hard drug and they steal stuff you know here and there and they like go in for a couple of days a couple of weeks whatever over the years they've never been in prison right so it's a very different culture um and security level uh it kind of varies according to housing unit i mean it's like you know, you have, so, so right. I was in Rikers Island. It's like an Island with a bunch of different facilities. Right. And, uh, you have, uh, high security, uh, buildings and units within buildings on Rikers, um, you know, uh, sentenced men, uh, where I was, I was among sentenced men. Everybody's doing 16 months max. Like that's the longest you can do 16 months and people doing 16 months are pretty rare. Like I had a long sentence at 18 months, you know, I, I was doing 12. So like doing 12 months is pretty long by those standards. So, you know, like there's different security levels within that, but in general, people kind of behave, right? Cause you probably, you know, if you're not an idiot. You'll like see the street again pretty soon. And um, yeah. And then you have a security classification level that's given to you based on this kind of like intake interview they do. And um and, you know, you, you like can or can't get like outside work clearance. You can or can't get into certain programs and stuff, depending on your security level. Right. So, uh, yeah. So like Rikers is generally medium, like the population I was in and in a population that people behave. Um, but, you know, it's like it's it's a very different ball game from prison. You know, um, I think Eric probably had a, a very, a very different experience because for one, he went to actual prison. Right. Um, I don't know if Eric, you want to take that? No. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested also, like this follow-up question I'm going to have for you, you can answer it when I'm done, about whether or not the conditions are better for the sentenced people at Rikers than for the non-sentenced people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know that. Um, so I was- Yeah, at, we, we, talk, we talk about that in just a minute. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I was in the feds, I was in the federal system, and in the feds, there's four custody levels. There's low, medium, penitentiary, supermax, I don't even count camps as I don't even list them. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't have a, if you don't have a fence, I don't count it. Uh, but so I, I was in all four and I think there's only been like seven people ever to do that in the, in the BOP. So I was oh, at shit. a low, worked my way up to a medium, 
worked my way up to a penitentiary and then worked my way up to the supermax. So, so I got to experience um, everything that the BOP has to offer and it, it's a nightmare. I cannot stress it enough how horrible the Bureau of Prisons is. Um, this isn't, it's not like you hear about like club fed and that shit, like maybe for the camps that exist, but like I did seven years in the shoe and four of that, I didn't have radio, phone calls, books, magazines, newspapers. Um, like we, if you resist in the BOP, you get crushed. And I, I experienced that. I felt that. Uh, this is like a lighthearted, fun talk, but I do want everyone listening to understand that, like, they go after you and they go after your family. Yeah. Like, they they abused my wife when she'd come to visit me. They taunted and tried to pick fights with my kids. I got I had, like, little five-year-olds. Um, these dudes are, are full-throttle pieces of shit that want to hurt want to hurt us. And they do. Um, I don't even know if I answered your question. Uh, yeah, but, somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it, <laughs> sift through it. Um, but I do want to know about the, uh, whether or not there is different qualities and how you're yeah. treated per sentence or not sentence. So, um, for one, I was never detained on Rikers. Like, I was never in pretrial detention on Rikers, so I can't speak to that. Oh, from personal. But like, I I was in. I was in two different buildings, right? I started off in C seventy six. If everyone, if anyone knows Rikers buildings, I was in in, in the six, and then I was in the four C seventy four. Um, uh, after about two and a half months, they moved me to the four, and I spent most of my bid there. And in the four, so the six is dedicated, or was at the time, entirely to sentenced men, so people serving what they call city time, sixteen months or less. And when I was moved to the four, there are like certain units for people serving city time, serving a sentence of sixteen months or less. But the other units are guys who are in pretrial detention and they, you wear different color uniforms. Like it's very clear who's serving a, a city sentence, who's serving city time and who's in pretrial people? detention. Like, yeah, so we're not this, together and stuff. Yeah. You're not in the same housing unit, but you um, will go to the yard uh, with other housing units and they might have pretrial detainees. Uh, we call them tans. They call us greens, right? Like because you wear oh, green, yeah, they wear yeah. tan. That's funny. And, and so like you see tans, uh, you know, in the hallway, in the clinic, uh, you might have a job. Like I worked in the kitchen. I worked alongside a bunch of tan guys, you know, for months, um, you know, went to the yard with them, you know, stuff like that. Visits, you know, the visiting like room where you're waiting to go out on the floor, you okay. know, you're changing clothes. Wait. So you spend time with these guys that are in pretrial detention and you have, you know, I got much more of an idea of what life was like for them than I had in the six, just mingling with them. And they have it harder. I mean, um, some of those guys, you know, it's like, they might be in for something really petty. They might be in for a parole vi violation. But other guys, like, they might have committed a really serious crime. And they might know that, like, their goose is cooked. And, like, they're going to go away for a long time. So they're already invested in prison culture more than they are, like, keeping their eyes on the street, you know, getting back to the street the way we are. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a survival thing. It makes total sense. But so there's, there's very much, like, sort of a, a, like, cultural difference between pretrial detainees and city time inmates. We call ourselves inmates. I, don't, I know it's, like, kind of a loaded word, but that's what everybody says. City time prisoners. Well, if I say that, it's not, you know, because I'm a bootlicker. It's just like, I didn't even know. I don't even know. The word inmate in prison has like ser serious connotations as opposed to convict. I didn't even know that until I was eight months into my bid. Like a guy who had served time upstate was like, you know, upstate, like we don't say the word inmate, right? In I was the like, feds, if someone calls you an inmate, it means you're a fucking yeah. dark and you need to get to work. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. serious we, accusation. Yeah. But we just say inmate, like incarcerated person. Like the, during, um, uh, the George Floyd rebellion, like one dude was like, inmates need to be like, you know, turning it up for Breonna Taylor, like green light CO, you know, like you could you say inmate in that way. And it's clear that like, because it's such a radical context, it just means prisoner, you know, anyway. That's really interesting. But yeah, so it's, it's a big cultural, di cultural difference. And then uh, to just put a button on that city time is very interesting because it is, again, speaking as a guy who's never been in pretrial detention and never been in prison, very distinct from both of those experiences like based on talking to other guys and just living through the city time experience in prison, you have more in general, you have more amenities. I think if you're doing time in like a, you know, if you're doing time in the shoe or like, I mean, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, but like guys who have been upstate, including all security levels for like people take uh, like sort of the prisoner code more seriously there. There's more of like a, uh, a, a set of rules about what you do and don't do in front of people. It's considered disrespectful to do this, that or the other. Um, 
you know, there's, there's like, there's more of a code and there's, there's more stuff to do. Like, you know, upstate New York, you could get like groceries sent in from the street. You could have a guitar, a typewriter, you know, cigarettes, That's whatever. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound bad. I'm sure. Good. Yeah. Good for them. But the Rikers, you don't have any of that. And unlike pretrial detention, be like, well, you know, I got a court date next week. Maybe I'll get out, you know, or I'm already invested in the 20 years I think I'm going to do. Right. When you're in city time, it's like, well, I only have eight months. But God fucking damn it. I got nothing to do. Like I made friends inside that like had served serious time in, in state prison, mostly, you know, in their youth. And a lot of them say things like this time is going slower than the decade I did when I was a young man. Like this is just insufferable you know so I, I, i've never been incarcerated anywhere else but anyway that's a long answer to your, your short question is that like there are important cultural and kind of psychological differences i don't know if there's a big difference in terms of comfort level but um but yeah culturally it's a big difference yeah yeah so i think something a lot of people don't realize until they go through the experience themselves is how much stress and anxiety and just the feelings that come with um, what you experience upon being indicted. Um, and yeah. I'm curious how you both handled your prosecution and your defense and kind of just the, just that time period of leading up into, you know, before you got locked up. So I'll go first on this one. Yeah, please. Um, yeah. So I've been indicted twice. So the first one, um, I was, I was bouncing around houses, trying to hide from the feds. They found me, arrested me outside my, my uh, friend's apartment um and i did 16 months of pre-trial detention like i i was inside pre-trial um and it's scary it's scary as shit because you don't have resources to fight your case when you're inside you have no idea when stuff's going to happen and your lawyers are not answering their phones they are not helping you um because they're so swamped the public defender system and the feds is so overwhelmed like these people care but they can't do anything um and so it's it's mentally exhausting and it wears you out like people end up wanting to take plea deals that are horrendous because they're just so tired of i was at cca so the private private pretrial facility um where it's the worst food you've ever had in your life worst bed you've ever had in your life worst most expensive phone calls uh, commissary five dollars for a bag of shitty ass kefi um God. so that's yeah, crazy know. um yeah this is crazy but so that was brutal and then the second time i was indicted i was inside the feds i was still in prison so mm -hmm. i'm having to fight this case from within the shoe now for assaulting this officer surrounded by this officer's comrades mm -hmm. They're stealing mail, interrupting legal calls, interrupting legal visits. I, no. I got put on a full communication banner for a couple of years. So I can't even talk to my wife and kids about shit. Mm -hmm. um, they do this on purpose, of course, to destroy our spirits and to make their job easier. And they told me this. They said, if you if you plead guilty right now, we'll get you out. We'll get you out of the shoot. We'll get you to your next spot. Well, the only plea deal they offered was 20 years. Uh, so. And the next spot would have been 20 years in the Supermax and ADX. And so if you refuse and you fight your case and take it to trial, like they make it as hard as possible. And I think it's something like 96% of people in the feds take a plea deal. And of the four that go to the trial, 96% lose because they make it so insurmountable to, to like wage a, a real fight for yourself. Um, I was one of the lucky few that won that one at trial against the feds, but it is, it's exhausting. It's scary. It's sad. You feel hopeless at times. Um, and if you make it out on the other side, like you feel really blessed. All right, go Can ahead. Can I ask a, a quick uh, um, rebound question on that? Which was harder for you if you had to pick one? The, um, the first indictment when you were still free, when you, like your first indictment before you've been away and you were wondering like, because you're facing significant amounts of time for both, right? Like, and so, 20. and then the other, like 20, you're already in, you're close to the end of your bid. I think you're like the three quarters mark. So like, yeah. you know, maybe you're in the shoe, like that kind of sucks, but you're like, all right, you know, I got this number of days left, whatever. And I'm out of here. But so, like, so the, the second one was harder. Because yeah. I've got a future now. I've got my wife, yeah, sure. I've got my kids. 
got a job yeah. lined up. I've got yeah. plans to get out. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden they're saying like, well, mm-hmm. we'd actually like to give you 20 more years. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. the few time in the bed is so hard. Like it's, I wasn't just like, well, I got this many days. It was, I hope I make it to tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a fucking nightmare. The second one, the first it's, one, it's I really... already knew I was going to prison. Like I chose it. Right. Yeah. So it's like at, at a certain point, you're just like, all right, cool. Well, this is the path I'm on. I got to just like put my seatbelt on and like roll it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did. I, I never had, you know, I never had a second indictment uh, or anything like that. But I there was a moment during COVID because the year that I did was like, you know, COVID year. I was in for like uh, four months when COVID hit. And like, you know, uh, there was a moment where people were getting out on mass and I wasn't one of them. Like, but like I was in constant communication with my lawyer who's putting pressure on you know da mayor's office doc like you know i had like calling campaigns like a lot of people were it looked like i was maybe getting out and then in a moment it became clear that it just wasn't going to happen and so i had to like remake my piece with like all right cool so i'm getting out in october right and again i didn't do that much time in the big picture but like i just know that feeling of like okay i have this date i can make it there oh wait i could be out of here tomorrow Oh, now I get it. Yeah, oh. like you know, yeah, like yeah. It's 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 very difficult to manage, and so like I think um to kind of tie that into uh, a response to the the initial question about handling the indictment, handling the case, uh, for me because I had plans that uh, I was really very much looking forward to right at the time of my arrest. Like, you know, I was already going to move out of the states. Like, you know, I was in a relationship that I was looking to like take to the next level. I had a lot of plans, things I was very much looking forward to. And then this kind of happened. And it's kind of like, well, you know, I chose to go out there, but also like, you know, I didn't expect it to go this way. I spent a lot of time feeling very sorry for myself. I was super anxious. I was super stressed. I was drinking way too much, smoking way too much weed. Like I didn't know what else to do, you know. Um, And I was trying to stay motivated and productive because I realized that that was a good sort of defense against it. But you know, at a certain point, you just have the energy, like, you know, and, and I, you know, I could really just like draw a list of the things in my life that I felt like were like crumbling before me. And that was harder, you know, in, in a lot of ways than like, really even just being in there and going through it. Um, because it's so uncertain. And it just feels so nefarious. Like, I feel like being in the hands of idiots who are like feeding you shitty food, while you all wear monochromatic uniforms is like, all right, well, this sucks. And it looks like the like, the real world in the matrix or something like it's fun but then like you're like it feels so malicious when people are like targeting and like grading things on paper that are like just blatantly false and like really nasty and could have a huge impact on your life it feels yeah. like i mean this is fucked up like how do these people sleep like you know um how do these people sleep you know so i well i mean that's a complicated question like i think you know um some of them are just straight psychopaths but uh you know a lot of them see it very differently um but yeah i mean the the time that i was like uh watching my case kind of draw to a close and increasingly becoming aware that it would probably end in incarceration was like super hard and in some ways harder than than um uh my time actually in and one thing that was helpful is working with a great radical therapist who uh never asked me for a dime treated me out of solidarity alone um, had worked with other incarcerated people that was really helpful was like write down everything you're worried about losing uh like write down every bad thing that could happen uh if you go away right on an index card write down every neutral thing that could happen and every good thing that could happen and then we're going to lay them out in order and we're going to flip them over and like take some notes and like build those up a little bit you know and like i still have that deck of index cards where it's like from worst to best things that could happen if i go away and, you know, in September, I will have been out or in October, I will have been out for four years. And it's like, you know, I just like picked that up and looked at it the other day. And it seems surreal, you know, because been out for almost four years, almost. Yeah. In, in October, yeah. Real, it, like, because time gets real weird when you're inside. Like when, yeah. I, when I think of you, I remember I remember when I heard about your situations in like the ABC newsletter. And that feels like goddamn yesterday. It does not feel like four years ago. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Or was it? Um, so if at all, but how did your experiences inside inform your radical politics? 
Um, and how, if at all, has it changed from before and after? Um, I don't know if you have any examples or like specific issues you could use as an example. Um, I'll go first. Uh, so when I got locked up, I, I consider myself like a Alfredo Bonanno, like insurrectionist type anarchist. And there is a level of pedanticness <laughs> to it. Like, I, I, I love of, the specificity of that. I'm sorry. I, I just like it. So what are your uh, beliefs? Well, I'm an Alfredo Bonanno insurrectionary. <laughs> as I said, very pedantic. Um, yeah. But like we were up our own asses thinking like we understood exactly how to topple this system. And it was through political like direct action and violence and all this jazz. Um, and that's what like that was the foundation of my anarchism. It, it was based on like toppling that system as opposed to the system in here. So when I got locked up over the years, I was like people showered me in books and articles when I was allowed to get them. And you start developing like a broader scope of like how you view hierarchy and how you view um power and that sort of stuff domination and so i got to see like the worst of the worst like for real i i got to meet people that were held in 24-hour lockdown for 20 years and they can't resist that way so how can we resist like what does resistance mean when they take away everything you have and that helped like really change me because it modified my anarchism and my radicalism to be about kindness it changed it to where instead of wanting to tear things down, I wanted to build things up. Yeah. I want to build a, I want to build a community around me to where the people practice mutual aid, practice solidarity, practice looking out for each other. Um, Cause people did that for me. And I did that inside prison too. Like I really tried to look out for, for those around me, whether they were pieces of shit or not, because I don't want to be an additional chain. I don't want to be another chain wrapped around your fucking neck. And so I, uh, my wife really helped me understand like radical vulnerability that it's okay to feel like if you're just saying this shit's easy and it doesn't hurt, then what's the, then prison's not that bad. It's okay to let people know that you are hurting and to open your heart up to them to help you emotionally and physically. And when I did that, it allowed me to be there for people that way. It allowed me to start seeing struggles differently. And so my anarchism and my radicalism now is I don't ever want to be someone's warden. I don't ever want to be that prison guard saying you can't have this, you can't do that, you can't say this. I want to be someone that people can talk to, be open with, someone that is there to help and wants to build build the communities that are so strong we don't need government. We don't need their bullshit because we take care of we. Um, the old black dudes always used to say like, uh, <laughs> what did they say? We we got we, um, I, we all we got, we're it, and if we're not gonna look out for each other, who else is? And that's the way. That's how my radicalism developed too. Into like, I want to be able to cry with you and help you when you're crying, and let's see what we can't do together. So that's what prison did to me, or what what I allowed myself to develop as while inside. Man, um, yeah, this is incredible. Did you have a, a follow up question with that, Alyssa? You can no. go ahead. Yeah, uh, that just was a, an incredible answer um, with uh, a lot of uh, really, uh, really great detail and, and texture to it. Um, and I don't really know how to follow that up. Besides, oh, no. uh, like, <laughs> I wasn't really that involved in the, like, anarchist or anti-fascist scene when I got arrested. Like, I was, I was like, doing a little bit here and there um, since, um, you know, uh, 2016. Um, I had been kind of in anarchist circles, um, and anti-fascism is just a staple of, like, left politics in general um you know especially anarchism um so like yeah anti-fascist like you out of your mind like of course you know and then uh you know like after um trump came to power and it's just like well there's a lot of people being like yeah man somebody should really do something well i gotta go um listen, you know it's like <laughs> well i mean who, who the fuck's gonna do this? you know like Dude. i don't know um it sounds over simple you know like it sounds simplistic but it's like okay well so i'm in a position where like uh i know where i can like meet like-minded people who are probably going to be down to take action you know um i know uh like kind of what the risks are uh i think i know why this is necessary and like uh, i'm also aware that's not not the only thing when i when i say it and this i mean like radical anti-fascist action that entails like largely 
surveilling or confronting fascists, like making it impossible for them to organize and like have public life that seems like no big deal. You know what I mean? Um, you know, that's not the only way to do it, but like, I think it's important. And um, on the one hand, it's, it's quite glamorized. On the other hand, it's like a lot of people don't want to touch it because it's like, man, that could get gnarly real fast. And like, it can, it did for me, you know? And, and, um, yeah. So, you know, um, so like, I just kind of got unlucky and, um, and, and uh, ended up going away for it. But at the time, you know, I wasn't super involved and, you know, I was never a person who put their sort of politics at the center of their worldview. And I still wouldn't consider myself that way. And I, I know what my politics are, I think, and I'm still open to discovering more about who I am uh, in terms of my political worldview. But like, I have a lot of different things, you know, like my reading list, the books that I wanted to read when I was in was like all over the map. And I even got a letter from some rando who was like, I really appreciate that you weren't just like, I want to read Asada Shakur's biography and Alfred Bonanno's autobiography. Does that, does that exist? Does he, you know, but like it wasn't just all like rad theory books. Um, it was like a, a lot of random stuff that I just enjoy because I'm, you know, like most people, I think a person who has a lot of different interests and, and a lot of different like you know you Nothing wear a lot of different hats more mentally exhausted towards like year like three through nine than getting theory books like radical yeah. books i yeah. wanted to get well, like political prisoner like i like those books but like yeah. when, the, when it's all theory coming i was like oh my god can i just read about wizards yeah, yeah. <laughs> i read about wizards yeah like, I, like I, anything you know. please at a certain point, I was picking up like the like David Baldacci, like you know, oh, like no. story novelist books. So, like this is great. This is just what I need, you know. Um, yeah. Like you know, um, yeah. Um, but so to talk about like how it changed kind of my politics. I mean, it, it definitely um, made me think about abolition, uh, prison abolition, and you know, police abolition. Like they're very, very, you know, the same thing, right? Two sides of the same thing. It's like, well, uh, never having been even in like the drunk tank for um oh. i'm discovering yeah no i mean I've, you know i've done a lot of dumb shit in my life i've generally gotten away with it um you know um yeah uh, you know i mean a big part of it is just like white privilege stuff you know like uh, you know I, I, the stuff the dumb shit that i did when i was very young like could get someone sent away you know if they're like coming from a, a position like where they're in an over police community or something like you know almost certainly um but like you know, yeah, I never dealt with that. And then here I am in jail. It's like, okay, well, so now I'm seeing what this is really like. Um, abolition, like, kind of like anti-fascism for me, it's just like a plank of anarchism. Like, obviously, sure, one day we want to get there. Um, hadn't really thought about it much. You know what I mean? And like, here I am. And I'm like, wow, this is so dumb. It doesn't work. And like, um, we could definitely be doing this other, in, a, in another way, in a better way, right? And this is right at the time that this sort of discourse enters the mainstream because of the George Floyd rebellion going on. Like, so there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of dialogue about it in the public sphere. So it, it definitely, you know, and I'm far from having everything worked out in terms of being an abolitionist, but it's like, yeah, I mean, I, that is something that I can unhesitatingly say now, you know what I mean? It also made me a lot more sympathetic to um, <clears throat> the label of criminal or felon and uh, just much more skeptical of cops and prisons in general. I mean, I've never liked cops, but just like, man, I, you know, I just I've been, been through it. And like, it's, it's just, yeah. I've no, never been I'm, more sure of anything in my life than that. Yeah. Prisons aren't, aren't what we need. And no, nah, yeah. Shit. Like prison yeah. helped me learn that concrete. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. And I think, you know, that that's an important thing too. Um, man, you, you, you talked about so much good stuff. Like we would need another talk because I'd really like to respond to all your points. Um, I'm so glad that you were developed, able to develop like, um, you know, radical empathy and like vulnerability in there. Like, cause that's super hard and, you know, it's like a strength, but it's, it's not always feasible, you know, like in some situations it's not um, it's, it's, it's like not the right move, you know, cause you, it's, 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 it's a risk to show that you're like emoting. Right. Um, but you know, all that stuff. I mean, you know, I feel like I learned a lot about myself in jail. And, and I think it's it's a strength to be able to say that. And and for you too, Eric, I feel like it's not, um, it doesn't mean that it's working. I mean, it means that we made something out of it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't I don't think it like proves anything about incarcerating people. Um, I think if I had like universal basic income, I'd be able to do the same amount of soul searching, you know, like, fuck, <laughs> you know, like, um, <laughs> you know, there's no need to lock people up. Um, so, yeah, I, I think like, you know, personally, I worked some shit out about who I am um, that was good for me. 
Um, I, you know, also personally, like, was able to um, focus on writing and translating and, and, you know, have been able to to build a bit of a profile as a writer and, and translator since um, since I got out. So, like, all, all those were things that I, like, kind of seized my time to do because I knew I was going to do this chunk of time. It wasn't that long, you know, just planning on moving forward when I got out. So, um, you know, and, and knowing that I, like, have a record now, like, you know, I, I can't, you know, get involved in anything that could carry risk again, right? So, like, for me, the sort of political work that I do is now mostly in, is, like, writing stuff, you know? It could be, like, me writing, um, you know, an article, whatever, or it could be me, like, writing to political prisoners, you know, because it's a zero-risk way to stay involved. But, um, but yeah, it, it I evolved on a lot of things, right? Um, and I think it, it would be crazy if you did it, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I do have a follow-up question for Eric. Um, just after your last uh, response, I was curious how it was being able to process emotions inside and um, just, I guess, the struggle between expressing yourself openly or keeping things in, which from your answer, it sounds like you were able to express yourself openly. Um, but I'm just curious about the dy the dynamics with that and how easy or difficult that was with the community that you that you had. So, the, like, I don't want it to seem like it just like happened, or like, like yesterday I was this way, but today I'm this way. Mm -hmm. This was a hard process. Um, I went into prison with like a lot of bullshit, toxic machismo. Um, I went into prison feeling. Uh, feeling like everything bad, basically, like violence was the answer, fighting is the answer, stabbing is the answer, bombs are the answer. And that reflected on like what I wrote people about too. Like I, I must've been so boring to write to uh, my first like year or two because I was almost like role-playing revolutionary. Like this is what I've taught. So this is what I now need to project into the world. And so Rochelle, like, it, it was just this process of like, do you, do you want people to see the fact that you're human or do you want them to see you as an object? Or do you want to be Eric King with fears and anxiety and hopes and dreams? Or do you want to be a political prisoner, Eric King? And for a lot of people, I was, maybe even still am, political prisoner, Eric King. Eric mm -hmm. who suffered. Eric who was locked up a lot. Eric who was attacked. Mm -hmm. Eric who fought. As opposed to like, Eric who still cries when someone's nice to them. Eric who has a hard time breathing around uh, white men with tattoos as one because those are the people who might be about to stab him. Um, Eric who just loves being silly and like joking at all times. Um, and so when when we started that, like when we started letting those guards down, like it started with poetry and all that stuff, like write it down. I can't always say it, so write it. And then when that started happening, I got such positive feedback. Then I, I, I started feeling safe. And if I feel safe, then I can open up and be vulnerable with people writing. I, I never, except for like a few people like my homie Randy uh, in ADX, I never showed that to the folks inside. I'm not going to let one of these motherfuckers see me crying or, um, being vulnerable or jealous or insecure or silly. No, I'm not showing them that because they will, like they were kind of talking about earlier, like they will see that shit as weakness. They will latch on to that. Right. Um, and motherfuckers do that shit all the time where they'll eat, listen, they'll ear hustle your conversations with your partners and then use that information against you or to try to try to pump you up, try to gas you up. And so, and the guards do it too. The guards who read our letters they would come to me and mock me with things about my wife. They would mock her mental health. They would mock my vulnerability. But our power, like through that vulnerability, I gained a power to not give a shit what these bigots say or these idiots say. Like my, my community was mine. It's not yours. Prison doesn't own this. Prison doesn't get to take hold of like my community. And through those people, like people like Josh or Badger or Brian, um, people like Jules and like these other cats that like really, really reached out to me. 
um, I got to be human to them and that allowed me to be human when I got released and it's hard and it's still a project. Like I, I sometimes still want to like am shitty, but it's a project. Like every day is just, how can I be better today than I was yesterday or kinder or softer or whatever. Man, I ramble. You're good. This is all That's great. Good answer. I really yeah. appreciate you being vulnerable right now and sharing this with us. <laughs> Yikes. Um, so could either of you or both of you maybe expand a little bit on the ways in which race and racism functioned in the facilities that you were in and your experiences with that? Yeah, you go first. Sure. Yeah. So, um, Rikers is not racially segregated. So, um, that this is just mingling of people from all backgrounds. Um, I mean, maybe that's not surprising. It's New York City. I don't know if Rikers was ever racially segregated. Probably at some point because, uh, geez, uh, this is uh, America. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, you know, I, I have no uh, knowledge of when when that uh, if there was ever a policy of segregation that ended. But um, there's some clickishness, like you know, but it often like seems to be based on other factors like gang affiliation um for spanish speaking or also non-spanish speaking but like of latin origin people right it's this kind of fluid thing where it's like well, if you look really like puerto rican but don't speak spanish like are you going to be in the puerto rican section or like not you know what i mean uh like the, this yeah this like it, and when i say section i mean what people choose to bunk like together so like there's an available bed there i want to take that bed next to you because you're you're also a member of x group right it's like there's some of that um white people tended to be clickier like a lot of people noticed that like people of color that i talked to and they would be like yeah you know it's like i've been coming to rikers for a long time and like there's like you know it's just like three or four white dudes and like they tend to put their beds together you know like they you know what do you, what do you mean I, put their beds do you guys don't have cells in your pods or uh no uh, we were in dorms we were in dorms the whole time oh that's yeah, neat. 50, 50 and 60 bed dorms. Oh, it's not neat. <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah, I mean, I, again, we have very different experiences, but like my first couple of months, I was like, I think I like am going insane. Like, there's no privacy, there's no quiet, there's no like nothing. Like, you're just in a fucking basketball court full of dudes, you know, and yeah. like, that's it. Like, you know, um, everything you do, like, every time you fart, every time you like, you know, get on the phone you know like every like it's just like somebody's watching it somebody's commenting on it you know it's like it's crazy so i was like i was trying to find a way to get a cell you know and people were like oh yeah it's easy just fuck somebody up i was like yeah okay great i'll just go up to somebody and fuck them up like that sounds like you know like what you know but it was i got the device from a lot of people if it gives you any idea like how dumb shit is in there um <laughs> like, I can imagine. yeah um but so, so racially, um, uh, it's, it's three like integrated, uh, at, at the official level, um, socially, you know, like the, there's people who just want to hang out with like, you know, their own kind or whatever. Like there's Could some you guys make meals but, like, together? Yeah, totally. There's no restriction oh. on that at all. I mean, uh, just because statistically, like there are very few white people in there. And also because I was very wary of seeming like a guy who preferred to hang out with white people um most of my friends are people of color just because like it's like 90 plus percent of the people incarcerated at Rikers right so like but then also like I, I had a couple of friends who were white guys and like I met up with one of them here he's an Irish guy I met up with him in Dublin in February it's great to see him um but you know like at a, at a certain point I was like bunking next to him and then there was this guy from Georgia not the state the country um right who was bunking next to him because he just like didn't like he showed up and like didn't speak any english it was just like oh god who, who I, and so you know whatever they hit it off but i realized at a certain point that like we had this like white section of three dudes you know and it wasn't like that like people weren't upset about it people but in other dorms you would see like like some shitty like scumbag you know like trying to be cool with everyone but also saying some pretty racist shit white dudes that like you know Put their bunks together another white dude shows up and there's an empty bunk and he's like oh yeah yeah i'm going there on, you know brother. yeah so like you know and that, that that has a lot to do with like you know just internalized white supremacy and feeling like oh like you know wow we're, we're not the ones in charge here like wow we're gonna get it you know like just feeling like insecure 
um whatever but but yeah there's no restrictions on like um you know who you work out with who you eat with like um who you bunk with like you know um you know you can yeah all that shit i there was a guy there there was like another white dude like two bunks over um when i was going home and the dude in the bunk between us uh was also a white dude who went home and then like the other guy was trying to give that bunk to to another white dude, dude who just showed up and i was like no dude we're giving it to the jamaican dude because he's been here for six months and he's super cool and like we're not doing the like white section thing like he's gonna get that bunk you know and i was going home like a couple weeks i had no real like horse in the race you know what i mean but like you know i was just like you can kind of break it up that way. You know, it's very, it's social. It's not like institutional, you know, um, and it's pretty flexible. So, yeah. What about where, uh, where you were? I mean, you were in a lot of different places, but I think that, that like, that is all the, wildly interesting, by the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, me and you yeah, have talked we, about we, this we'll shit off. Again. Yeah. We've talked about it off camera a lot. Like I, I just find yeah. it so interesting. Um, yeah. So in the feds, it's the exact opposite. Yeah. I mean, from ground yeah. to the top, you you are not doing these things that David just yeah. described. Um, and it's enforced by by violence. So yeah. at a low security, like it's gonna be mostly like social violence. Like you're gonna get ostracized or shit talked yeah. or gossiped on. Um, and so like that's all gonna be like white collar criminals or rats in either way. So like uh but once you get into like the medium penitentiary, like that level. You, yeah. you will not do that. Um, and the reason you will not is because your teeth will get kicked in. Yeah. I would have loved to have to have had like a black or a uh, Pisces Ellie. Um, I was friends with all those dudes, but your, peop your people will, will kick your fucking head off. Yeah. Um, and I've seen it. So like, you're not making cups of coffee and sharing them with other races. You're not working out with other races. You're not uh, you're hundred percent not living with one. You'll get, that's it. Uh, you won't get inside that cell. You won't make it to bed. Um, and that's something like I always hated. So one of the, one of the ways you could get around some of this in the feds is like, if you're gambling, you can, you can play cards and games with other races. Cause it's, it's a, it's a gamble. It's a money-making thing. Yeah. And so I would play Scrabble just 24 seven and Pisa's, <laughs> Blacks, GDs, Muslims, whoever, like, come on in. Yeah. Um, and so, like, that was a fun way to get around that. It's just, like, you're just constantly playing games and cards. Or in the the law library, I was – because you're allowed to make money off other races, basically. Like, that's how it is. And so my hustle is typing legal work. So I could interact with other races that way. Um, but it's gross. It's gross. And I, it feels like it, it comes off, like, you brought up insecurity – Man, like white victimhood is so real. Like they're out to get us. Everyone's out to get us. When it's really like, you guys are out to get everyone. Are you can't. If y'all just chilled and we're right. trying to like run everything like dickheads, like you know, a typical white supremacist fashion, like maybe things would just be better for everyone. <laughs> it, and it would. Yeah. But yeah. so like in the penitentiaries, when you get up to that level, it's everyone, and yeah. like it's defending territory. Like if this is a uh, if this is Serrano yeah. cell. It's staying in a serenio cell. And if the whites try to take it, like it can be a war over that. Sure. Or if there's three TVs, one of them is a white TV. If an, a black dude tries to take that TV or use it, that can cause a war. Um, not just like a, oh, let's fight about it. I'm talking like a bloodbath over this perceived territory. Yeah. Um, and when you, sorry, just, just to jump in real quick, because um, I think I, I understand this, even though I've never done prison time, but like, can you explain why that's a war? So, like, let's say I'm a white guy who doesn't really, I'm not invested in this thing, right? Now there's this beef over a phone or a cell or something, right? That was a white phone and now it's going to be a black phone or a Serenia phone. And then, like, why why does that cause a bloodbath? Why can't I just say I'm not dealing with that? So, because. Great question. Um, yeah. So, when you're in the penitentiary system, when you're at that level, you have to participate or you will get killed um, right. or at least fucked off bad. Uh, you cannot sit out. So yeah. the second you get there, you're put on the list to put in work. And mm -hmm. that's where you have to jump someone to show them that you're not a coward, to show them that you're about the life. That way, when shit pops off in the future, you're not dead weight because people don't want We don't need an extra body. Um, so you have to prove that from 
the day you get there is called mud, mud checking. Um, and so if someone takes like a white TV, they've essentially said in, in penitentiary terms, like white people are bitches. We don't respect the whites. We'll take whatever we want from you. I hate racism. I hate it with all my heart. I, I went to prison fighting against it. But I would have to join them on that fight. Or once it was over, I'm getting stabbed by those white guys 100%. I will not make it a child the next day. Um, and it's all about like this domination. Like no one will take nothing from us. This is ours because the state took so much from prisoners. We now do it to each other. Mm -hmm. You're not going to take my space. Um, mm -hmm. and I've seen it, I've seen it go sideways in ways that were like a white dude was owed 40 bucks by a, uh, a Texas, a Texas MA and the Texas MA said like, no, what are you going to do about it? And so the white guy had a choice. I either accept that or and if I do accept that, I'm now a bitch yeah. and these other dudes are going to kill me. It's or I make, I make an example of this cat. And they ended up cutting that dude's stomach open and pulling his intestines out. That guy's an ADX for the rest of his life. Uh, it's it's like, like a bit of an overreaction over 40 bucks. I do understand you have to defend your name, but Jesus, I mean, you could just cut his stomach open like normal. Have to yeah, and it could have just been like a casual stabbing, but he wanted to make a point to all other races: you will not disrespect yeah. the whites. Yeah, and yeah, that's really that. how it is. And it's, ugh, it's. I'm so happy I'm not in prison anymore. So, and again, I just got to ask because um, you've been to a lot of different security levels and um, uh, facilities, and like I've been to a couple different buildings on one island. Um, but I, because Rikers is such like a crossroad of. Uh, incarceration like there's people who've done time like all over the place right because it's new york like it's a it's, yeah. a lot of people move there from elsewhere um a lot of people are just passing through and they get caught up whatever and because the system doesn't work you know you may well have done time in another state before you move to new york and then you get arrested for something else right so like you meet people who've done time in a lot of different places and uh i met a few people who told me stories of racial sol or solidarity across racial lines um in uh state and federal uh, facilities I, I met a guy who said you know when he was in arizona he was in the ab because he didn't have a choice and you know he was kind of a sketchy guy you know i didn't know if he was just saying that for my benefit a aryan brotherhood if you're listening you don't know what ab is he, he said he was in Aryan brotherhood when he was in prison in arizona and he said ab and whoopty woo that's the bloods like stuck it up together um they they like went on strike together and refused to work um over some i can't remember what the grievance was but like yeah like i heard it couple stories like that uh from other like jurisdictions security level systems about yeah i, I don't know is it something you've ever heard of or seen or so no? if that dude by the way just arizona ab's are are not the same as federal ab's that dude okay that dude seems like a i don't i don't know um but what i do a lot know, of people like, a lot of people make shit up uh you know i mean a lot yeah, of people you know. lie yeah yeah uh, but but you know that stuff can happen when it's a system-wide thing so like okay. In the, let's say in the shoe at USP Lee, that's a penitentiary in Virginia, USP Robert E. Lee. Virginia. Um, <laughs> my, home, my home state. Maybe so, I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> uh, we, in the shoe, the kitchen workers cut our trays in half to where everything we was getting or were getting, they gave us half of it because someone had wrote on, someone back in the shoe had wrote on the tray like kitchen workers are bitches or something. So they revolted against us back in the shoe. And the lieutenant, the shoe lieutenant was not doing nothing about it. They don't care. And in that shoe, you don't have radios, you don't have books, you don't have magazines, you don't have newspapers, uh, and you don't have a commissary. So when your back's against the wall, like we we planned to strike interracially then. Mm -hmm. um, because it was a everyone thing and we needed everyone. Yeah, and sure. so, like, those are the situations where crossing racial bounds is allowed. But there, even then, there's a fine line. There's mm -hmm. a very delicate line where it seems as if, like, you're playing too hard for them. But your people will bring you back down to earth. Um, and I, I ended up getting crushed by the cops for that, for that little small strike. Because they don't like racial solidarity either. Like, they do everything to they make sure that does <laughs> Yeah, they hate that. <laughs> oh, they hate nothing more than racial solidarity in prison. 
And so I, I helped the Muslims when I was at Florence Medium. They were mm -hmm. they started doing some stuff. So I rode with them. And the cops tried to give me jump all the time. Like they they'd go out of their way to whisper in other white dudes' ears, like, Your your guys that love sand in words. Your guy's an end lover. Oh, look at him, he's a this lover to instigate violence because if we're together, like they're they're not shit. Yeah, absolutely. They know the the collective power that's held. Yeah. Uh, so was it with that kind of segregation? Did it ever feel alienating being an anti-fascist political prisoner in those situations? Like, how did how did you manage that? Um, from my like from my perspective, every day of my life felt alienated. Like I've got Antifa tattooed on my face, and people know what that shit is. Like they know. Yeah. Um. And so not only do you feel like isolated from people, it's lonely. Like you don't have no one to talk to. You have no one. Not a single white guy in that prison will openly agree with anything you you agree. Um, but it's violent, like it's dangerous. I I got in a lot of fights, like I, guards, prisoners, like this shit. It you're not above it because you're a political prisoner. Um, because what you don't want to be is a political victim. So I was lonely all the time. Like if it wasn't for letters, uh, by it that it's just even hard to put in words, because you're isolated as fuck. And no one cares. Like no, not a single white dude in that prison cares that you're lonely because you can't talk about how much you hate Trump or that transgender people are actually people. And then when it started getting later in my bid, like into the shoes, well, now it's I'm all by myself, literally. The only people I have contact with are the guards. They hate everything you stand for. So they're tearing up your cells, throwing away your pictures, throwing away your mail. I got scars on my head. I show it all the time. A guard, a guard dumped me on my head when I was handcuffed behind my back. They did that because of, because of the resistance, because of anti-fascism, refusing to play into their bullshit. So I, I took a hard line when I first came in the feds that like, I'm not, we're not losing who we are. And you, you can pay the price. It's not like guaranteed, but like if I had said I'm anti-fascist in the penitentiaries, I, I would have had to stand on that and I I would have got stabbed or someone else would have. But instead I got I got jumped off that yard. Like the white Nazis said, like, you can't be here. And I said, yes, I can. And they said, okay. And then the guard set you up for them to to jump you. And that's what that's what happened at a penitentiary. It's it's scary and it's lonely, and that's why we need prisoner support because people inside can be very isolated. Absolutely. Yeah. That's um that's the stuff uh just to piggyback on that, this is stuff I was trying to avoid in taking one one of the things I was hoping to achieve in taking the plea that I did for a shorter amount of time, like a comparatively short amount of time compared to what I could have gotten if I gone to trial, blown trial, mandatory minimum. I would have gone upstate state prison system, right? What was your mandatory three? Three and a half, okay. uh on the top charge. You know, I could have gotten it's like a maximum of fifteen. I mean it's a it's a really ridiculous statute. Yeah. Oh. Um so, you know, I could have done some time upstate. Um, there were some proud boys who, you know, got got hit with the same charge and blue trial like idiots and got four like a few months before me. That was that was like a factor in my like, there's, there's also the Manhattan DA's office. I was like, OK, it's pretty clear they're trying to do like a both sides thing. And like, yeah. I'm the only guy they have on the left right now. So maybe I'll just like cut my losses. And um, yeah, I wanted to avoid going upstate because, you know, from all the the research I was doing, from what little I knew, uh, it seemed like upstate, uh, among other things, like they're um, more rednecky, they're more Trumpy, um, they're more cousins and in laws e, and um, they will absolutely fuck you up. And you know, this is something that like we talked about uh, that I like. I was seeking confirmation of from guys who knew more about uh, life upstate once I got in, right? And there were mostly like yeah dude like things are much less comfortable here and much noisier there's like more people addicted to hard drugs who don't understand that you can't just like go around like farting in front of people all the time you know stuff like that like that that's the sort of thing when i say there's more of a prison code i get the impression in the feds or in the upstate system like you know uh just it's a little more hectic in jail yeah yeah like you can get stabbed over that in prison pretty easy i have the impression but um so yeah like b besides the fact that like it's it's noisier and less comfortable in jail like you know um a guy like like me like 
you know, I had a case that got some publicity, like, um, you know, a fascist, uh, I was accused of like attacking this old man or whatever. Um, like they would know that and they would set you up to get fucked up. And like, yeah, I just don't want to deal with that. You know, I, from what I understand, the um, the Nazis, the like uh, Aryan Brotherhood and like other white supremacist gangs are not super strong in the New York state prison system. Um, I've heard that from a bunch of people. I've I don't know how true that. that is. Yeah, which is good. Fuck them. Um, yeah, they, they, they are not on Rikers. I mean, they have, uh, I have a friend, a fellow activist who did uh, some time on Rikers in 2016, and he was falsely accused by uh, a gang intelligence officer of being in the AB. And, uh, you know, he, he said, oh, I, I'm aware of 12 of you on the island. You know what I mean? Which is just like, it's very telling, right? Like there's, at any given moment, there's thousands of people. I mean, the population varies, you know, from one year to the next, right? But like, you know, it's 12 people are in the AB. Like they don't advertise that shit. You know what I mean? Like they, and, and, and they can't, you know, I mean, I had uh, the cop that I worked, the CEO that I worked under in the kitchen, uh, who, you know, when I first started, like asked me to roll up my sleeves so that he could make sure I didn't have any Nazi tattoos. Cause like, he's like, you know, you got the look. I was like, okay, you know, thanks. You I mean, got the look. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, I meet the criteria that like the, the Nazis have been very like, oh, yes, look at this big blonde head. Yes. You know, like, yeah, that's good. but so like, what would have happened if you rolled up your sleeve and there was something? Uh, he, he, might have let me get fucked up he probably would have told okay. me like i don't want you working for me like you're not going to come you know at the, and which I'm like, is, is the, 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 the um what happened to your microphone just then did it did it get weird yeah it got crazy weird yeah uh -oh. i thought let it was it just <laughs> no it sounds good now though yeah you sound okay. good now um, all right. Well, maybe and, I was uh, in yeah. your in your jail, like in the feds, certain races own jobs as well. Like in the kitchen, like the Mexicans will have the meat, the blacks will have the cheese. No, uh, is I, I assume like by your shaking no. your head that that is not the situation. Not the case. Not the case. <laughs> I even had I even had a dude. Um, I was making grilled cheeses one day, which is awesome because okay. I don't know what kind of food you guys got, but we did not get grilled cheeses. Holy yeah, shit. And so they give that like you prepare the food for the court holding cells. Right. So you just you sitting there mass producing like, you know, your fucking assembly lining. Two slices of American cheese and a little and two slices of bread and put it in a plastic baggie. All right. So you got piles of these. Right. Man, they let you use one of the ovens. You know, they're not supposed to, but like they look the other way. Put some of those on a sheet with some uh, fake butter, you know, put in there. Incredible, right? So I used to make those all the time and just give them away. And like, I'm telling you, I would make a bunch of these and just give them away to everybody, right? And this one guy I know from the yard, I don't really know him. He's like an Italian guy. And he, he sees me loading these into the, uh, well, he's like Italian-American. Oh. <laughs> but but also, could, you know, could very much. <laughs> We're loading, I'm loading this into the oven and he's like, uh, he said like, hook a brother, a white brother up with a grilled cheese. You know, and and I was like, "Don't play that shit with me." And he, I swear to God, he looks at me and he goes, "What? I'm white." Like, because he was kind of like, you know, it's like Mediterranean looking. And I was like, "That's not what I mean." Like, what I mean is like, don't make it a I'm thing. White, like, like well, white people, like I'm gonna wow. give these to everyone. Like, you know, and like you know, so there's no like, yeah, there's there's no racial control of like ingredients and stations and stuff. That's yeah. Neat. I gotta run to the restroom real quick. We got you can I like, ask questions. I'll be I'll be right back. Sounds good. Sure. Okay, here I go. So when you were in there, did you meet any other political prisoners? I did not. Um, I think he he will have probably a much more uh, interesting response to that when he comes back. But I did not, and it was kind of uh, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah, I kind of wish I had. I met some people. Um, no, I didn't even meet any George Floyd like uprising people, um, which I was stoked for. Uh, I talked about this some in Rattling the Cages. Like I had like I was putting out the word with people that I worked with, like in the kitchen and that like I saw at the yard who were in other housing units. It was like, if you get anybody who's coming in for like George Floyd related stuff, let me know. And like I got a care package for them, like, you know, um, and I really wanted it to happen. But it yeah, didn't happen. I mean, George Floyd popped off like uh, four months before the end of my sentence so it's not a ton of time for all the cases that were actually being prosecuted right yeah, um, well, yeah. Until you were out. yeah they, 
yeah they were like doing like overnight in like the precinct you know yeah, the, yeah they weren't like going to rikers so but i met a guy who you know claims to have gone out rioting with antifa like you, you know <laughs> And the George Floyd, he was picked up for something else. He was picked up for heroin or something like later. But he was like, yeah, I went out rioting with Antifa. Uh, I have a bunch of like Canada goose coats that I want to sell when I get out. Like, you know, <laughs> I like, that's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, but like, yeah, no, no real political prisoners. I met a lot of politi politically conscious people that was super cool. And um, it was cool to meet and be understood by um and and to like you know just get that like all right cool like you know i'm not gonna fuck with you um sort of like low level respect um which is very nice you know just to have because you feel like you're in such an alien world you know like whatever from politically conscious people that like are jail people jail or prison people like working class people of color primarily who like understand what's up and like you know like cool that was that, that was comforting in a way it's like it wouldn't change anything if I hadn't gotten that for me, but it's just nice to meet someone who's like, you know, I met this old guy who was like, oh, you know, when Asada Shakur was on the run, she stayed at my aunt's house on like Farmer's Boulevard in Queens or something. And it's like, that's yeah. fucking cool. You know, I'm glad you told me that. And you told me that because you saw me reading Asada Shakur's biography, you know, like, like this, that, things like that, you know, like. I really appreciate shit like that. I met a guy with a huge uh, Machateros uh, tattoo on his arm a puerto rican um, like radical group and like we used to talk a lot in the kitchen you know um you know i i, I met a lot of people who had radical sympathies and like had had some sort of political consciousness and like kind of understood where i was coming from and that was cool you know but i didn't meet anybody who was doing time for political stuff absolutely what about you have did you uh encounter any other political prisoners in your, um, your time so I uh, I was cellies with one of our elders. Um, I don't really even want to talk about that right now because like other stuff. But I met a lot of political prisoners that weren't left wing political prisoners. Yeah. Like I met a lot of like big name Jihadis. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, that's interesting. I thought you were gonna say like right wing. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's a type of right wing. Um, um, like the jihadi dudes. Like I met like Richard Reed, the shoe bomber. Yeah. Uh, I met like different different big name terrorist dudes from there, and like I had really interesting, great conversations with them. Um, the way that they stand on their ethics, the way that they do not like how do I how do I put it? Like they they are not apologetic. Like they believe in their cause and they are willing to talk about it, stand on it. So I found those dudes really interesting. Um, and I also met people that like. I don't know if they're if we count them as political prisoners, but their communities do. Um, like I met Larry Hoover, the head of the GDs, and to what is that? What is that? Gangster Disciples, the largest. Oh uh, yeah, gang. okay. And yeah, so okay. he's been in prison for fifty years. Yeah. He he is considered a political prisoner by people in Chicago and people who are sure. familiar with that gang. I met Jeff Fort, who used to do body. He was a bodyguard for Martin Luther King. Uh, now he's in his 80s because he tried buying missiles from Gaddafi. So we don't necessarily consider them political prisoners, but they are leaders and political leaders in their communities. And I find them wildly interesting to talk to because they have so much experience and they've read every book I've ever read and they've, they've been down for 50 years. So they they just have a lot of wisdom and input, even if it's not like, I don't know, fucking Emma Goldman input. It's still like input from their communities, and that's more valuable to me at this point in my life. Yeah. Um, oh my God. We don't have that much time left. I still have so many questions for y'all. <laughs> um yeah. you okay. some questions. I have a lot. <laughs> Let's see. Um We're I guess until seven, right? It's only six. Like we can do the question QA with people if people have some. Um but like, if worse comes to worse, like we still got like forty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can hit me with some questions. Cool. Uh, so, what were some of the relations between um, people that were locked up and the guards? How did the prisoners like refer to themselves and the guards? What terms were used? Um, I guess just like, what were those dynamics like? I'm sure you guys are gonna have very varying experiences. 
Yeah, well, if I can start on this, I mean, we've already touched on like um, terminology, you know, how it varies between state and federal prisons. And yeah. in my experience, jail, and I can't say this is true of all jails, but like in terms of what you refer to yourself as, you know, uh, like inmate is, is a very strong word. Uh, it's generally an insult to my understanding in state and federal prisons, but like, you know, um, where I was like some guys who had been upstate would like, you know, evoke that distinction, but like they, they kind of realized it was a lost cause. Like, you know, on, on records, it's just like, you can't go around identifying as a convict. People were like, okay, but like you're, you're locked up. Right. So like, you're like, you're not a CEO. So the only other thing you could be is an inmate, you know, like, you know, it's just kind of this thing. Like, uh, and then the, the thing that uh, I think is maybe more specific to local jail facilities is there's quite a lot of crossover in terms of neighborhood ties, even family ties, uh, and sometimes gang ties between the uh, prisoners and staff. So a lot of this stuff on Rikers. And they've, um, you know, they've done... Um, I think the the was an NYC uh, Department of Investigation, if that's a thing. But there there have been like you know official you know so, some official people have looked into this stuff and been like, oh yeah, it's a real problem. Um, like there's there's a lot of people who have family ties, neighborhood ties, um, or or yeah, again gang gang uh, affiliation on Rikers um, in different color uniforms, right? And so like sometimes like there there's um, there's a little fluidity in the like sort of um, rule about not being too buddy buddy with the the cops. Um, there's definitely stuff that will sound alarm bells for people. Like that would be a red flag. Um, you spend too much time talking to a cop, um, or like you're spending time alone, um, speaking in a language that other people don't understand to a cop in front of other people. Like, I was trying to practice French in there. I believe it or not, I was shocked. I didn't. I couldn't find any other prisoners who uh, spoke French uh, mm -hmm. fluently. I, yeah, I was surprised. I, I met there's like a, a lot of people who spoke French Creoles, like you know Haitian guys. But Haitian Creole was like you know, I mean, it's it's just not the same. You know, it's like I don't speak that language. Um, and and a couple other like you know, uh, different like French Creole languages. But you know, the only people that like i met that spoke french it was like there were a couple of west african guards you know and i was like well you know they saw me reading books in french to try to talk to me in french you know like oh what was there like yeah 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 i speak french i'm i'm reading this book right now like i can't talk to you <laughs> like you know there's like but but in general yeah this there's kind of like um you know, especially short term, you're getting out soon. There's a sense of like, oh, you know, there are people too. They're just working this shitty job. It's a good city job. You know, you get full benefits and retirement in 20 years. Like, you know, and, you know, people, um, you know, like, uh, oh, God, a lot of a lot of a lot of like uh, elders who've done time at Rikers have written about this. Um, I think Asada, Angela Davis talked about that. Was Angela Davis at Rikers? I don't think so. She was locked up on the West Coast. Um, yeah, but um, but yeah, there's 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 like that's the thing that's been observed kind of going back is that like you know most of the guards on Rikers are are working class people of color, right? Like they're just like that's I want a. Thing. What's that? That's, that's a tricky situation too. Yeah, I mean, well, everybody wants like a decent job that's not going to disappear, right? So like, all right, if I can do this, especially you know. And if you uh, read or listen to interviews with former CEOs, they will tell you like, listen, I grew up in the projects. It's the same architects. It's the same people. I'm not scared to like walk through here where a lot of people are. And frankly, the pay and the benefits are not bad. I started, you know, 22, I finished at 42. It's like being a cop or in the military in terms of like that one straight shot, two decades and you're done. You cash in all your chips and like, you know, you do something else. A lot of people, you know, that's that's their mentality and so people who are getting locked up from the same neighborhoods as them for you know dealing small amounts of like drugs or whatever or having a gun in a neighborhood where everyone has a gun it's like you know uh some of them have a very developed like prisoner code sort of mentality where it's like you know us and them you know cops versus criminals and like you know um you know which i'm i'm more partial to i mean uh but yeah, there's there's definitely a, a lot of crossover where it's like 
you know, that's my like your cousin's uh, sister-in-law. And, you know, I see her at a barbecue every year and she used to like, you know, work in um, a warehouse in the like, you know, office or whatever. And she started doing this because she like wanted a decent job. You know what I mean? Like that, there's that's shit like you kind of hear floating around at Rikers, which I think makes it a little distinct from a lot of other uh, prisons. I don't know how it stacks up against jails, but I, I would bet that a lot of local jail facilities are more like that. I think you're right. Um, yeah. So where like where my machismo stuff hasn't faded is my intense vitriol for these cops. Um, sure. I, uh, I, the idea or even just the thought of having a casual conversation with one of them makes me want to puke. Um, these bastards. Uh, and it is different. Like, they're <laughs> not, it, it's different. Um, like, I've been chained to beds. I've, I've been chained for hours. I've been put in a cell with nothing in it, with the air conditioning blowing as hard for weeks. I've had mail destroyed. I've had my body destroyed. When I see people associating with these cops, like I let those people know that like you're playing a dangerous game. Yeah. Um, if I saw someone being like I would talk about this in the shoe with smiles, uh, like these are not our friends, these are not our allies, these are not our comrades, these are not our neighbors, these are people that receive a paycheck to torture us. These are the 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 slave workers, the owners that would ride around on the horses with the guns. Well, they're just doing a job, like no motherfucker, they're not. Like they chose this life. They chose this. Um, and because like in the feds, like they're almost like a militarized occupied force. Uh, they're not our neighbors. They're not people from the block. They're people from all over the country that transition in and out. All these old veterans getting, uh, getting their PTSD jobs. And they are abusive. They, I've met two cops since I've been down that I, if I was in a riot and saw them getting killed, I'd feel bad about. I wouldn't jump in to help them, but I would maybe have like empathy. Like, well, they were pretty decent guys. Sorry. Sorry about your luck. Um, they. The, yeah, I feel the, that. I, 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 I like, I, I see you speak about that and I see that it's coming from the heart and it's coming from a place of experience. And like, I totally get that and respect that, <laughs> especially because I'm more partial to drawing a, a pretty firm line between like prisoners and COs and like, you know, I never went out of my way to antagonize any COs because it didn't seem like a great idea. But like, okay. I'm I'm much more like I don't want to be your friends. You know, even the guy that asked me to roll up my sleeves, who was my supervisor in the kitchen, you know, over time ended up, you know, being very sympathetic to like a lot of things that we're talking. about. like he he knew about my case. He looked it up. He wanted to learn about like you know he wasn't prying. He wasn't like asking me where's the rebel base. He was just like, so why do like anti-fascists care about Black Lives Matter? Like when the Floyd stuff popped off, you know what I mean? Like wanted to have that conversation, right? You know, um, and like, you know, I was happy to have that with him, but like in a place where other people can see us chatting and we chat for a couple of minutes and then I'm like, I'm going to go over here because I got something to do. You know what I mean? Um, you know, and he, you know what? He did ask me to snitch once in like a moment where it looked like nobody was around and it wasn't a big thing. It was very minor. And we had already built up a rapport and I was like shocked and disappointed that he asked me that. I'll you know, I was like, yeah. But you know what? He He wasn't petty about it afterwards. You know, he like, he didn't take any any of my like perks away. You know, he's keep, you know, you know, my last day he, was the same day as one of his um coworkers was having a retirement party. He went to the retirement party, took a piece of cake, and brought it to me. You know, like shit like that, you know. It's a rapport, you know, it's a rapport. You can have that. I'm okay with that. But I'm I'm more partial to this sort of world where you're describing where it, there's a distinction there, right? Like, because we're not on the same team. And even if for you it's just a job. Well, you know, lots of people have rationalized lots of mad shit by saying it's just a job. <laughs> and it's not, uh, it's just not, you know, you're keeping people in boxes for like, you know, what a plumber makes. I mean, not that it would be better if it was a lot of money, but, you know. I, I've i got five staff assaults like in my, on my jacket from pre-trial to getting out. And like, yeah. I, I wish I had 10. I wish I had 20 because the, the brutality of these pieces of shit in the feds. Um, Feel that. Oh, it yeah. just makes me shake. Oh, let's see, you got me shaking with rage. There, there are <laughs> cops that I met in there that I would like like to have like gone. They talk about shooting a fair one. I don't know if that's a thing that um, 
they don't get fair league. ones, these motherfuckers. I was supposed to have a fair one, and that's what they do. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's kind of an old school thing, too. I have the impression that it's not really very common anymore, but, like, you know, you used to be able to, like, go into, like, the pantry with the cop that you have beef with and just, like, fight, yeah. you know, and then, like, it's resolved, whatever, you know, whatever the, the issue was. It's just, like, we let it, you know, be after that. And, like, there are cops who's like, man, I really wish it was a thing, and I really wish I wasn't, like, worried about, like, extending my stay here because it's pretty short and I got a life to get back to. But, like, yeah, yeah. there are people who's like, you're a piece of shit. You're lording it over other people in really petty ways. And like, yeah, I would love to punch you in the face, you know, but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm do the right thing. Okay, so yeah. what's, the la- what's the last question or next question? We got 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes. Okay. Let's see. Let me pick a few. Um, okay. I have, t- I have two more questions. Is that fine? We're just going to have a speed yeah. answer okay um okay so i'll start with this one before you talked about um how it was very alienating being an anti-fascist and you touched a little bit on the significance of getting letters when you were in prison can you talk a little bit more in detail just about what it's like to be getting communication from the outside world and the effects that that has when you are in a situation like that um Yeah. yeah So I did it both ways where I, when I first came in, I didn't have any support. Uh, Denver ABC, if it wasn't for them, like who knows when I would have started getting letters. Um, And then I went through a period of mass amounts of letters and then a male band where I wasn't allowed anything, where it was like, they would just send them back. I wasn't allowed mail. Um, And the difference is like, how do I put this? When you get letters from people that like really care about you, it can be the best part of your week. It can be the difference between wanting to hang up and wanting to like do burpees and smile and laugh and joke. Um, I met my wife through, through letters. I got my job through letters. Every friend I have right now in my life, except for like four or five still in Kansas City, are people that wrote me. Josh Davidson, who I edited the book with, He's a friend from letters. He wrote me letters when I was in the shoe at Leavenworth. Um, these are like real relationships that can be built. Like David wrote me. That's how we became friends. Yeah, bro. I was just about to say. That's how, because I knew about your case before I went away. I think you heard about mine while you were in. But mm-hmm. the reason we're talking today is because I started writing you after I got out. Yeah. And, um, and, and you nice started letters. texting me once you got out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <I'm nice. laughs> so like this, I like writing letters. It, like, I can't stress to people listening enough or anyone who ever does YouTube, like you can save someone's life with mail. Yeah. You can build a relationship that changes your entire existence in a good way through through letters. Um, I've always encouraged people to write my bro in ADX. I got mm-hmm. I sent out 150 letters to him last week from people because that can be the difference between him feeling so alone, so sad, so forgotten and feeling like, damn, people really got me. Like, I'm going to get out of here. I've, I have a future. And so I like, please, please write prison. Please, for the love of God, like write anyone. And if you want names, come all around me. All right, David, go ahead, bro. That's, that's about the size of it. Like the letters <laughs> just matter so much. They're just like the, the sign of the solidarity that you're getting. There are lots of other signs. Like, you know, you have money on your books that like, you know, people run out of the way to put in. Like you have your, your visiting calendar is always full, you know, like stuff like that. But the mail is like really incredible and it's, it's really hard to describe. It's like one of the hardest things to describe. I think, um, you know, I mean, I got, uh, I think it was 21 letters, a calendar and, uh, three books my first day in. And I just like started crying in the hallway on my first day, but the first day I got mail, it was like, I was like a weekend cause it takes some what? time to catch up. And, but I was just like, man, and thankfully there's nobody there. Oh God, I can't. Um, <laughs> Aww. sweet <laughs> um yeah don't make me cry again um <laughs> I love kids. <laughs> um yeah no but i i like was so moved and was so surprised by how moving it was just to get a bunch of letters mm-hmm. you know it's like uh, just people who took the time you know and That's um the yeah. they took yeah. the time like you have to really you can't just accidentally send a letter it's not just I, like clicking a like on the internet you have to put in work Right. And you're yeah. saying that this person is worth it. You're worth yeah. that time and work. And I mean, a lot. It, I take that serious. 
it could easily go the other way and it's like well it would be easier for me in my life out here on the outside to just move on and not worry about it and like not take the time and it's like mentally draining and then like i'm invested in this person's life i can't understand a lot of things because like the world's you know when you're locked up it's just very different you know like um yeah it's just like it's it's kind of like a commitment to a relationship and you know um it's like it's daunting so when people are like you know yeah i've made the decision to do that and then you receive those letters inside uh you know it's 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 pretty incredible and people i don't know people send you a lot of books and stuff i assume right when well, i was allowed yes, books yeah when you're allowed books yeah um that's kind of what i meant um like were Hundreds. you allowed to receive a lot of books Hundreds. yeah i said so, i got so many books i mean uh within like a month i had to ask people to stop sending them because i had too many i was giving them away yeah. at like an alarming rate like it was like it was not that's okay one of the best like, feelings is like someone says like oh man i wish i had this book and then you ask a friend like, shows up in three days yeah here you go because that person's probably not going to get a single bit of kindness yeah. and all of a sudden you get to pass that solidarity on it's so a beautiful cool. feeling it's a wonderful thing i i had um actually the haitian dude i was talking about earlier um wanted a, a dictionary uh just so he could work on his, his like english grammar and stuff and he was like yeah we just don't have any old dictionaries lying around i had a giant like french english dictionary but it was like not, i needed it all day and it was like not what he needed and i was like you know i just asked my defense committee like just like order a dictionary from like a used bookstore and like send it to me and you know it's just like a little gesture you know you know yeah man it's pretty cool you know it's but yeah just just yeah get, getting letters man it doesn't sometimes it doesn't even matter about the content is it could just be a postcard it's like damn it's awesome you know to everyone sending out books and letters of prisoners thank you so much i sent a book today my friend smiles he needs books that are uh he needs adult coloring books randy platt at adx i'll hit you up with the address if you guys need it he needs adult coloring books he's finally allowed colored pencils oh it's the last question well i guess we got 10 minutes but probably the last question we we'll want q a yeah um, do you have any advice for activists who are either currently facing incarceration or who are currently um, maybe taking risks that could put them in that position? So I'll answer quickly. Um, and I said this before, and people don't always like this answer, but it's like, firstly, understand the consequence of what you're doing, that mm -hmm. it can lead to this. And if it does lead to this, then you need to know that you better be prepared for violence. Mm -hmm. If you're going to a penitentiary or a high medium, do not think that you're above it all. Do not think that you're a pacifist or whatever. Learn to fight. Learn to make knives. Learn defense. Learn uh, how to tackle people or do MMA. Be prepared so that you are not a victim. Like We are still within this horrible system. And I have seen people go and be like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a part of it. And they leave without their teeth. Do not let yourself be a victim. And like, obviously, like have support going in, have a book list, have people you trust, um, have have money ready if you can, if you are privileged to do that. But please, for the love of God, do not enter into this jungle and think that you're above it, because I did that for a little bit. And it is it's stupid. It's stupid as shit. Be, do not let yourself be a victim. Um. Yeah, hey, it's great advice. Um. I would say all that. And then to round that out, maybe a little. Um just try to keep as cool ahead as possible while you're facing charges because it's so hard to do that i, I mean I, I don't even know like no that's the know, smarter like that's the pre-advice so like, learn but you can do that at the same time that you yeah. prepare to go away you know if you're like i think i might have to go away all right well that is terrifying and you know like it was terrifying for me um but uh, like i was able to kind of pull that off to where it was like all right at a certain point I, I was like, I'm going to do at least a year, maybe like two, you know, towards the end of my like plea deal situation. So I was like, all right, cool. And I was talking to people on my defense committee and they're like, all right. So we like got a domain for a website. Like we have like a, a spreadsheet set up that we can use to like organize visits so that like, you don't have people double booking, like fighting for Preparing the slots. Ahead of time, like, that's amazing. Hearing that perspective. It was insane. I had uh, people, they put me in touch with therapist radical therapist i would say absolutely get a radical therapist or a therapist who understands I, your i get free emdr stuff. treatment i recommend it i hear it's great it's um um what i had people i had people would show up in so many ways like uh teaching me meditation techniques that a couple of different people teach me ways to like you know 
just like uh, try to get into my own head and chill out in uh, even in very busy environments. I had people teach me self-defense stuff. Um, you know, uh, one guy who had done prison time, it was like, you don't want to do that in there. Like, it's not going to work out. Like, you you know, it's going to be like, the guy's going to come back the next day if you just kick him in the balls. Like, you know, it's not like, um, you know, uh, that was very helpful. But like any anything like that you can get that's like practical um, is actually a way of coping. For me, it was a way of coping with anxiety and uncertainty about it. It's like, cool, empty time. That's absurd. Um, but, you know, we all deal with these things. It's like, you know, you wake up one day and like one of your parents has a cancer diagnosis and you're like, all right, this means I'm going to spend a lot of time in hospitals and it's going to be really hard. And like, but that's you find a way to do that and you work it in your schedule practically, you know, mentally, you know, like so there's there's ways to create some distance for yourself and just like, all right, so this is what I need to do. And um, I don't know, that that was kind of the approach that was helpful for me. I would also say that if you're going to learn about what life is like in there. Try to focus on um, the actual facility you'll be going to. And if you don't know, then it's probably going to do more harm than good because there's just so much like a lot of bad shit happens in jail and prison. But like, you know, that stuff does tend to float to the top in terms right, of if reporting. You're, if you're preparing for USP and you go to a low, like you're going to look ridiculous if you go in there trying to tough guy. Uh, yeah, like it's awesome. just it's a completely different. Like I was going getting ready to go to Rikers, which is like reputed to be like this horrible place. And look, it sucks. But like among sentenced men, city time guys. You know, not detainees. It's like, well, we're all going home pretty soon. I mean, people fight over dumb stuff like disrespect, you know, whatever. But um, they're not stabbing each other and pulling each other's intestines out, you know, like, <laughs> right? So if I had been preparing for that, if I had been YouTubing like how to stab someone and pull their intestines out, like it would have been not entirely relevant, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we got five minutes left, so I just want to tell anyone watching that doesn't already know me or, or Smiles, please write Randy Platt in ADX. He's got 14 more years there. He's already done five. He's my best friend. 207-64081, Randy Platt. Uh, P.O. Box 8500, Florence, Colorado, 80501. This is my best friend. He saved my life multiple times. The cops tried to send him into my cell to kill me, offering rewards to him. And instead, he wrote my lawyers telling them, this is what the cops are doing to set Eric up. Like, you guys need to know this shit. Uh, and there's a thousand instances like that. So please support my homie, Randy Platt. It's on my Instagram. Also, uh, support Eric King. But please write my homie smiles. Yeah, that's great. Um, I would actually just like to, like, mention some some political prisoners real quick, too. Um, uh, Jesse Tolkien Cannon uh, right, started a five-year sentence in California State. Um, these are all anti-fascist political prisoners. Um, Great guy. Uh, Alex Stokes, uh, Conte Passes is freealexstokes.com. He's doing 20 years in New York State. He's waiting on an appeal, but his, his sentence is completely like ridiculous. Crazy. Um, Gage Halapowski, uh, he's probably near the end of his six years in Oregon State. Um, you can find these guys in uh, on Anarchist Black Cross's website. It's abcf.net. It's prisonersolidarity.com. Uh, International Anti-Fascist Defense Fund, stuff like that. If you're looking to get involved, just uprisingsupport.org as well for people that are doing time for stuff related to the George Floyd Rebellion. Um, yeah. Um, if if you don't know where to get started and you want some people to to write a letter or a postcard too, because that is a, a really easy way to um to or brighten somebody uh, somebody's day, yeah. This movement cannot yeah. win and cannot exist if we don't support those who go go away for it. Amen. Yeah, for sure. Everybody agrees in yeah. Thanks, y'all. And we'll definitely get y'all to write all that down so we can send it out as a follow-up to anyone that registered today and put it with the video Perfect. recording. Just because I know that was a lot of information, people might not have been ready for it. Um, but uh, we'll we'll. Gage is out, that. by the way. Gage was released. I just got a text about it. Oh really? Oh yes. sweet. Welcome home, welcome home, Gage. Thank you. Hey, welcome okay. home, Gage. Welcome That's home. great. Y'all, this was an incredible conversation. It really blew me away. Um, and I think just seeing how many people like signed in at the very beginning and did not sign out. I think yeah, that you was know, crazy. You should, it's great. I, I know that I know that folks are really appreciating <laughs> everything y'all were sharing. Um, well, we've got a we've got a wrap for tonight. Uh, but 
Um, so much appreciation to all of y'all. Um, so glad that y'all are both out now. Um, we got to get more people out. And Alyssa, thank yeah. you for being a fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. Uh, I really appreciate you, friend. Thank yeah, you thanks so much, Alyssa. So much for yeah. having us, and it was great talking to everybody. Yeah. Have really a great, great night, y'all. Thanks, Liberty. Thanks, Alyssa. Night. Eric. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody.